Welcome back. So for this lecture, we're going to be talking about phonology in Middle English. Um, and so we'll focus on some of the sound changes, some of the new sounds that we had, some of the sounds that we lost during this time. Um, and there's been quite a few changes during this time period. To begin with, we'll start by talking about some of the struggles with documenting some of these. So documentation during Middle English um, is a little bit difficult, especially at the beginning of the Middle English period. There's not a lot of written evidence in English during the first part of Middle English, especially before around 1200. Most Mostly because French was the official language, most of the things that were written were conducted in French. Um, so there wasn't a lot of writing being done in English during this time. Most of the speakers of English, the uh, working class people, were not literate and were not the ones that were doing any sort of writing. But there, during this time is when we're also seeing a very rapid change in sounds and rapid change in usage, largely due to this lack of standardization. So during the end of the Old English period, there was a sort of standardized version coming from the West Saxon dialect. By the Middle English period, when uh, France took over and there, the Normans took over and the French was the official language, there was not really any standardized forms of English being used. So this exploded all those dialectal differences and made it much more difficult in, to sort of have a centralized kind of way to write everything down. Um, but because of this, because there is no standardization, we can actually learn a lot of the sound system of Middle English during this time for what is written in English, because the correspondence between the written and the spoken forms um, is starting to become um, something that you can start to see change as well. So the new standardized English that we start seeing at the very end of the 14th century, towards the end of the Middle English period, is no longer West Saxon, so that was the Old English form, but rather the London dialect, so the dialect that Chaucer spoke and this is largely because that was where the center of government was that was where the center of power was so that was the most influential area for these sounds um, and for this dialect to sort of emerge as the standardized form to go over some of the main changes that we'll see during this time period with phonology for consonants, we'll see that there's a loss of long consonants. So there used to be a distinction between short and long consonants in Old English. We lose that during Middle English. And we'll start seeing some new sounds that are actually phonemic. So the voice fricatives in Old English were just allophones of the voiceless ones. We start seeing during this time that they become phonemic and they become separate sounds in the language. With vowels, we start seeing an introduction of the schwa sound, so our uh sound. Um, and then we'll also see a few different processes take place in certain environments. So we lengthen some of our short vowels. We also shorten some of our long vowels in certain environments. And then one of the things that will affect morphology that we'll see in the next lecture is that there's also a loss of the unstressed vowels that takes place, especially at the ends of words. So if we look at some of the consonant changes first and then move into the vowels, um, we'll notice that there's a long consonant loss in Middle English. So Old English featured long consonants, and we'll still see some, some of them present, but the distinction of them is lost during Middle English time period. So for instance, the Old English difference between man for man and man for mankind is lost. There may still be pronunciations that are similar to this, but it's not a phonemic distinction any longer between different words. So you'll notice that we use man in both of these ways to refer to man as a person or man as mankind um, using the same form. And this is because of that loss of the phonemically distinct long consonants. One of the biggest changes in terms of consonants during this time, though, was the introduction of voice fricatives as phonemes. So our voice fricatives like z and v and v appear in Old English just as allophones, but they become phonemic in Middle English, and there's quite a few reasons for this. During this time, the distribution of them is still relatively limited, and we don't yet see the post-alveolar fricative z adopted yet. So that one comes in much later. We haven't had that sound added into our vocabulary um, and into our sound system. And there's a lot of reasons for this increase in the distinction of z and v and v as separate phonemes as opposed to just as allophones. So we'll go over some of them. One of the big reasons is the influx of loan words that we find, especially from French. So French already had a distinction between f and v, for instance. So view versus few, vile versus file. Um, and as we're borrowing those words in, they're showing up in the exact same place. It's no longer just that voice fricatives are in between vowels, and therefore they can only happen in this allophone environment. They're starting to show up in the exact same place. We're seeing this increase in minimal pairs between them. So we kind of have to adopt that V sound from French because we now have words that begin with it, the same as we also have words that begin with an F. 
So English needed to start making this distinction as we're starting to introduce these different sounds. But French did not have our dental fricatives, our th and th sounds. So the French influence alone wasn't enough to create all of these phonemic distinctions, but it was li largely um, influential, especially with the words that we were borrowing from French. We're also seeing at this time a lot of dialect mixture happening. So some southern dialects started voicing all of their fricatives in initial position. This was just a pattern that we started seeing where sin became zin. And so the voicing isn't actually reflected in the spelling though. So the spelling would still have the same thing, but they would just pronounce it with the voiced version in all, some Southern dialects. And as the Southern dialects had different influence and as su Southern dialect features moved north, north, this increase in communication would have led to some of that change over time as well. So that over time, people became accustomed to voicing some of these sounds. So even some of these other sounds, not just F and V, but also things like S and Z that are also being voiced in the exact same environments um, and can be found in the same environments as the other voiceless versions will also add to this change. We'll also see that there's a couple of other reasons, such as the loss of final vowels, which we'll talk about in a little bit. In Old English, we saw that fricatives were only voiced when they were surrounded by voiced sounds. And so we were used to having things voiced in this environment, but as time moved on through Middle English, we start losing the final vowels, especially if they're not stressed. So as we start losing those final unstressed vowels in Middle English, the voicing is still remaining there, even though we're no longer pronouncing that final vowel. So the condition for the voicing disappears, but the voicing stays there. So something like huizan for to house in Old English would have been huizan, and then hueza, and then huaza, and then huaz because we got rid of that last uh sound. And then the voiced version is still there, even though it's no longer in between vowels. So it starts between vowels and is voiced because of that environment. And then we lose that final vowel and it's no longer there. Um, but we still end up seeing with that loss of the vowel that the voicing ends up still being there. And so this gives us some of our present day distinctions that we have, such as things like to house versus a house um, that most dialects would have, um, is that we're getting this distinction because of the old influence of what used to be an allophone and became a phonemic distinction. Finally, the other reason that we get some voiced fricatives is that in some lightly stressed words, we start just voicing some of the fricatives. And this is especially true with some of our function words. And a lot of our function words have those dental fricatives in them. And this is where we start seeing some of those distinctions come into play. So rather than is or was or off, we start seeing is, was, of, his, the, instead of the. So we're starting to see that in a lot of these function words, we have voicing starting to take place during the Middle English time period, and that continues today. These All of these uh, function words, we have voiced sounds now instead of the voiceless ones we would have seen in Old English. Voice fricatives tend to require less energy to produce, so there is an ease of articulation aspect happening here. We tend to voice things by default as um, we're sounding things out, so we would rather voice things than not. It's a little easier to voice things than to have things that are voiceless, and so we can see that playing a role in why this might be happening, especially with very commonly used words. And we still see a little bit of variation with some of these words. So you might hear some people say with or some people say with, and that might even change within a single speaker depending on what words that the with is coming next to. So we're still seeing some variation in some of the voicing with some of these function words, although for the most part, most of them are voiced and have remained voiced since. So to summarize some of the other consonant changes as well and give kind of a list of some of the different major and minor changes that we're seeing, we see a loss of those long consonants. We're also going to start seeing a loss of an H sound uh, before our L, our N, our R sounds. Um, the R becomes a W sound after our liquids. We start losing W sounds between consonants and between back vowels. And so we'll start seeing the loss of that extra W sound that was found in some words in Old English. Um, we start seeing a loss of a final ch sound in some unstressed syllables. Um, the prefix, the ye sound that was used in the past participles, um, sort of switches and becomes an i sound and is spelled a little bit differently as a result as well. We lose the final n in a lot of unstressed syllables as well. Um, as we mentioned, we start seeing some voicing of some of those voiceless fricatives in southern dialects um, when they're starting a word. And we start seeing some borrowings with those words as well. So words with V and Z in particular that were coming from French um, in initial position removes the environment for allophones because we're starting to see minimal pairs and we're seeing them in the same environment. We start seeing the voicing, especially of initial th 
in um, unstressed function words. And then we start seeing a lot of these fricatives that are left in final position as voiced as we lose those uh endings um, at the ends of words. So to summarize the consonants and just take a quick look at the middle English consonant chart, you'll notice it's starting to look closer and closer to the present day consonant chart. We're seeing that the fricatives are now phonemic, they're not in parentheses, but we're starting to lose the use of those velar fricatives, so the ch and r sounds that were sometimes found um, in certain environments, we're starting to lose that. We still find them occasionally in allophonic environments, but we're starting to lose that, and by the end of the Middle English period, we're not really using them very much at all, um, and we'll see them completely disappear by early modern English. But note, we do still have the voiceless w sounds, so we have the h sound that's still um, present, as well as the voiced sound as well. For vowels, there's a lot of variation. There's a lot of difference. We saw um, in the previous lecture how all of these different dialect changes exist, how there were so many distinctions between dialects. So there's very little agreement about the vowels in Middle English. So what we'll focus on for this class is the London dialect. It's the best documented. It's the one we have the most information about. It's going to be the one that's easiest to determine what sounds we were actually hearing based on that documentation. But there is a great deal of variation in text at this time, and there's a great deal of variation of how things might be expected to be pronounced as a result of that. So we also start seeing an emergence of our present day lax vowels in uh, the pronunciations. So this is based on the loss of long vowels um, and the presence of tense and lax distinctions sort of emerging in what they would likely end up actually sounding like. And we can see some changes to vowels in two categories. Some of them are qualitative changes um, where the actual sound itself is changing and some of them are quantitative changes where the numbers of things that are doing for certain things are changing. So if we look at some of the qualitative vowel changes. We're introducing a new vowel during this time period, and we're starting to get schwa into Middle English, that uh sound. And this is appearing only in unstressed syllables. So similar to what we see today, where we put the uh sound into these unstressed syllables, we're starting that introduction of this in the Middle English time period. So this was really beginning towards the end of the Old English period, um, and then continuing through Middle English, a lot of short vowels except for e we're starting to reduce to that schwa in unstressed positions. And so this ended up also contributing to a lot of the morphology changes that we'll talk about in the next lecture, because this reduction contributed to a loss of most of our English inflections. So most of those distinctions in the different vowels that were in those different inflections all ended up becoming almost the same vowel or almost the same sound. And so it contributed to some of the loss of those inflections. We also see this schwa developing um, as a sort of vowel that comes in between two consonants. So rather than putting multiple consonants together, we'll see a schwa sort of develop in between consonants. Um, and we'll see that in some of the examples that we listen to um, and some of the examples that we see throughout this time period. Some more quantitative changes, though, um, in the vowels are things like the lengthening of short vowels. This is known as open syllable lengthening. And this started happening in the 13th century, where some of our low, lax, uh, mid front and mid back vowels begin to lengthen in open syllables. And when I say open syllable, this is referring to any syllable that doesn't have any consonants after the vowel. So a syllable without a coda. So this would be a syllable that's consonant vowel, and that's the entire syllable, rather than something like consonant vowel and consonant. So the consonant at the end after a vowel would make this a closed syllable. It's sort of closing that vowel off in between the consonants. This would be only happening in those CV open syllables. And later during this time period in the 13th century, we start seeing I and U lengthen. Sometimes they'll lower sporadically in some of these open syllables to A and O. And so there's a lot of variation that's taking place, and not all of it is as patterned as it may seem, or we may just not have enough information to know all of the exact patterned reasons for some of this. But in Old English, short vowels were beginning to lengthen before certain consonant clusters. So liquids or nasals um, were um, that were followed by a homorganic voice stop, so an LD ending or an ND ending, for example. Um, we start seeing some short vowels lengthen in these environments. Um, homorganic just means that they both occur in the same place. So LD and ND are both alveolars, and so that would just be what that's referring to. Um, and then by the 14th century, some of those vowels shortened again with some variation. So again, additional variation, things that aren't quite um, as easy to see the patterns for during this time period.
At the same time that we were lengthening some of our short vowels in particular environments, we're also finding that we're shortening some of our long, long vowels in other environments. This was known as closed syllable shortening, where the long vowels that were in closed syllables began to shorten as early as the 10th century. So this could have been happening um, in the Old English time period as well, but by the time we see a lot of English texts in the Middle English time period, this would have been taking place much more extensively. And this is where the long vowels in closed syllables um, are going to be shortening, except with some words that have an st ending. We don't see that happening as much. And the environment where this t tended to happen was that if there were two unstressed syllables after the stressed one, the vowel in the stressed syllable would be shortened. So instead of something like Christ and Christmas, you see Christmas, um, break versus breakfast, you get breakfast. And so we're seeing that in those multiple syllable words, you have the vowel shortening. And this ends up leading to some of the distinctions that we'll see in early modern English with the great vowel shift to where now we say Christ versus Christmas or break versus breakfast. And this is because of that loss of the long, the long vowels in these longer words. We also see the vowels in unstressed syllables shortening as well. So dom in Old English um, ends up showing up in Middle English in an unstressed syllable as wisdom. So rather than dom, you see dom with a schwa. And so we're starting to see some regularization of shortening and lengthening taking place, but there are still a lot of irregularities that aren't as easily explained by these patterns. So five versus 15, wise versus wisdom. Again, some of the great vowel shift changes in early modern English that we'll see in a couple weeks are playing a role in this as well. Um, but there's not always um, a clear um, pattern that's affecting everything equally. There's some a variation that's found within some of these as well. And while we're, we added in schwa as a vowel during the Middle English time period, we're also seeing that there's a loss of unstressed vowels frequently. So we add in schwa and sort of replace this in unstressed syllables, and then we start dropping that schwa in some of these unstressed syllables during this time period. So the pronunciation remained optional in many dialects. We see this especially in poetry. So there are going to be times that we'll still see that pronounced um, in some of Chaucer's work and some other work during this time that may not be pronounced in some other areas. Um, but by the time that Middle English was over, this inflectional unstressed uh, sound was beginning to disappear even if it was followed by a consonant. So we're beginning to just see this losing and going away very frequently. That's, and that's going to contribute to a lot of our morphology changes as well. We still see that E written, but no longer pronounced except in certain environments. And so we still see this in some allophone and allomorph examples, so where we still have um, some inflections, so wishes, wanted, versus checks or puffed, where you need to have the additional sound there to separate two sounds that are very similar to each other. But in general, we don't really see that by default. And as I mentioned, this had a drastic effect on our inflectional system because the distinction between a lot of these different endings ended up disappearing. They all ended up sounding almost exactly the same. And so for a lot of these common words, the only distinction between adverbial forms and nominative forms was the final E that was there and then they were all a final E. Um, so some examples in Old English, you have deop for deep and deopa for deeply, um, heard as an adjective versus hard as an adverb um, would have been a distinction as well. So we still see a few of these distinctions, but they're starting to fall by the wayside as the time period goes on. And we also see a loss of that final E in French loanwords sometimes, but not completely. Um, a lot of French loanwords still kept the stress on the final syllable in Middle English. And so this is why we see the, pres the preservation of that in some cases. So uh, city, um, so cite for city and pureté for purity, you'll notice we still pronounce that final vowel. It's a different vowel because of some of the other sound changes that have taken place, but we still have those final vowels today because of these French loanwords that we were um, still pronouncing. So if we look at some of the vowels and some of the sort of sources for where these vowels ended up coming from, you'll notice that there's some differences compared to the Old English chart. So if we look at the short vowels first, you'll notice that the, re the realization of these vowels is now different and now more mirrors our present day lax vowels. So things like e and e and e uh and e uh and o uh um, are things that are still coming from these Old English vowels that would have been more tense in nature. Sometimes some of the um, diphthongs are there as well. And then we see that the spellings are still relatively similar to what the Old English spelling would have been, but the pronunciation would be a little bit different.
With vowels, we see that the tense forms are still remaining most of the time, although we do see a eh and o, oh, the mid vowels, um, as long vowels as well. So we're seeing a distinction between a eh and a, eh. we're seeing a distinction between o oh and o. Oh. Um, and so we can see this, and this will play a role in early modern English and some of the vowel changes as well. And during the Middle English time period, we also saw a great increase in diphthongs. So by the end of Old English, we didn't really have many diphthongs left. We see a lot of them coming into um, usage during this time period, coming from different sounds that we saw in Old English, often a vowel plus a w sound or one of the velar fricatives or a y sound would have led us to the creation of a diphthong instead. So um, day um, from Old English becoming day, a little closer to the way that we would pronounce it. Um, things like the um, ow com fr coming from an a ah and a h or an a ah and a w sound, we see just turning into a diphthong as well. And then we borrowed a couple from Old French as well, the ui and oi sounds um, that became our present day oi um, sound um, came from French during this time period as well. So to summarize some of these vowel changes, we see that there's a reduction of the final vowels to a schwa. We see some open syllable lengthening in some environments. Um, we see a lengthening before certain consonant clusters, things like chrysomasa. Um, we see some closed syllable shortening where long vowels are becoming short in certain environments. And then we also see a loss of these unstressed vowels. So we introduce a sound specifically to um, be found in unstressed syllables, and then we start deleting that sound out. Um, and this ends up affecting a lot of our inflections and a lot of our morphology as well. The Middle English Language From the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales One that April with his shawl and sota, The draught of March hath pierced to the rota, And bathed every vine in switch liqueur, Of which thereto engendered is the floor. One Zephyrus ache with his sweater breath, in spirit hath in every holt and hearth the tender crop is, and the younger son hath in the ram his half coursey run, and smaller food is mark and melody that sleepen all the nicht with open ear. So pricketh him natur in her courages, and longen folk to go on pilgrimages, and palmer is for to saken stronger strondes, to ferner halloes cooth in sundry londes. And specially from every shearer's end of Engeland to Canterbury, thy winder, the holy blissful martyr for to that him hath hopen, and that thy were saker.